spinning. All right, there we go. We'll give, uh, I see about eight, 18 now. We'll give uh, just another minute and then we'll get started. So who wants to see something on record in the meantime? <laughs> As we are <laughs> recorded already. <laughs> All right. Um, quiet now. <laughs> yeah, let's let's just go ahead and get started. For recording, folks can catch up. So, um, I appreciate everybody joining. Um, this is our first um, technical architecture forum for Conveyor. The idea behind these meetings, um, and 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 I think it was in the invite, but we're gonna try. We're gonna do these once a month. Last Wednesday of the month, idea here is is for folks to be able to raise areas, um, technical areas that they want to have discussions about. Um, could be new technology, could be opportunities for us to, to share technology, could be something cool that one of the projects is doing and wants to share that out. Um, uh, there is a Google Doc that's in the invite that you can go in and add your suggested agenda items. Um, and I'll, I'll be taking a look at that and trying to make sure that we level that across the meeting so that we, um, we have only, you know, we don't have too much on a particular day for us to cover and we have ample time to have discussion. So, um, meant to be a complete technical conversation. Um, um, so engineers talking to engineers kind of a thing. So. With that today, we actually have two things on the agenda and what, what we'll get started with is a conversation around um, around a project, um, uh, and I see John on here, um, uh, called Scribe. Um, a lot of folks probably already know about that, um, and, um, and potential usage for that in our migration tooling um, as what we would use to actually handle um, persistent data during those migrations. So I know there's a desire uh, potentially to go down that path. Um, so wanted to uh, ha take the opportunity here to have that discussion in this forum um, and see um, if that made sense. Um, and uh, if so, if there's questions or things around it. Um, I think Sean may be prepared to have some of that conversation from the from the NPC side. So what I'll do is step back um, and um, uh, and let maybe uh, uh, Sean, if you wanted, I, th I think you had some slides. If you want to start there, that may drive the conversation, if that makes sense. Yeah, that sounds good. So I talked to John yesterday, made sure that I wasn't completely off my rocker. Um, so go ahead, I'll present today, uh, right now. Uh, seeing the slides now, yeah we, we could see them we kind of see your whole desktop um, oh, but i think if you put it in okay here we go we can fix that that's a solve yeah problem. that's good okay cool um uh, oh, boy it's been a while since i've used this i apologize Okay, right, we'll just go through it like this. Um, so real quick, uh, this is my current understanding of Scribe. I think it'd be good to make sure that this is um, what we agree on. Uh, so Scribe constantly reconciles or over some uh, interval reconciles uh, that the source and destination clusters um, are synced. Um, it also uh, is working purely with Kubernetes. It does not work. It does not have any OpenShift specific bits inside of it. And then also um, the main method that directly correlates with how we are moving data today in MTC is is um, SSH with Submariner. Um, and that's, that's kind of what Scrap is doing today. They have another method with our clone uh, that goes to a bucket uh, for CSI uh, snapshots, but we use Valero for that instead. 
so it's not directly analogous. The one thing that we that we do similarly is um, is our sync our copy data across using some sort of tunneling technology to connect the two clusters. Um, with, is that a? And I wanted to open this up to everybody on the call to make sure that uh, what I'm saying here is correct, and also make sure that. Um, there's no questions or anything like that. So I guess with with respect to um, the SSH and and Submariner, um, so yes, we use um, our sync over SSH, and the there's no there's no like requirement to use submariner right we just need to be able to have the the source connect to the the destination um and so we expose that via a service um and so you can make that service either you know cluster ip or load balancer type service uh so you know if you're like uh trying to replicate between say you know a uh, uh, or to a, a destination cluster that's like running an AWS, right? You can just create a load balancer service and the cloud provider goes and turns that into um, an ELB. And so it's, you know, it becomes accessible from, you know, anywhere, right? No need to, to run Submariner or anything. But that being said, you know, if you guys are creating that, you know, that secure tunnel already with Submariner between your source and, and destination cluster, you know, we, we certainly should be able to run the traffic over that, uh, that tunnel. Yeah, I think that brings us into like the next slide, but. Um... So yes, Sorry. Marco, uh, one PV. I mean, you could do multiple, right? But it's it's designed to set up a relationship that is uh, PV to, to PV basically. So it says PVA on cluster A constantly sync with PVB on cluster B. And so those are, are the same data set, hopefully at a point in time, right? This is for point in time, not for uh, like constant syncing. I, I believe you, it's out on a timer, correct? Right. So, um, in the in the CRs that you use to define the relationship, you can put a, a schedule in there. It's just a cron spec um, to basically say how often you want to sync, or you know, at, at particular times of day or whatever, right? And it'll run a sync, you know, at the at the appropriate times. Um, you can also skip that, and it will just sync as fast as it can um, if you don't provide a, a schedule. Um, I guess the other. So I you know, I don't know if that really answers the question, the, the point in time thing is um, we, we typically recommend um, creating point in time copies on the source, right? Either by using a CSI clone or a CSI snapshot um, in order to, you know, sync a consistent image across to the, the remote cluster, but that's not actually a requirement. We can sync a, a live PV and you kind of get what you get in terms of, of consistency when you do that. But it's some, it's a solution that works if like the source cluster doesn't, you know, isn't using a CSI driver, right? So you can, you can still do it. And in that case, you would probably want to do something like, you know, start the syncing and let it get things, you know, mostly, um, mostly there and then, um, you know, stop your application and allow it to sync an, an additional time, right? To make sure that that everything got over to the destination in, in a consistent way. And just to make sure I'm I, I'm correct in this statement, um, there is no current like built-in mechanism for quiescing or unquiescing applications. That would be the user's responsibility to stop the deployment, to create the scribe resource, let the data sync, and then un, and then re spin up the application. Is that a fair statement? Um, yes. So we are basically whenever Kubernetes gets a, a mechanism for doing the, the quiescing, right? So the container notifier stuff, whenever they bring that in, then we'll, 
we'll go ahead and pull that into Scribe. But um, I'm pretty reluctant to go and, and try and add a one-off thing that we know is going right. to be just temporary. Yeah. Um, and then have Makes to maintain sense. that long term. How do you how do you make selection of because I think you have the the um, you know the data the data mover um, kind of uh, mechanism. How, how do you do you, do you make that uh, that selection when you're creating your CRs? Um, uh, how, how is that done, John? Yeah. So there's um, there's basically different sections to the CR. So if you fill out the one for the R sync mechanism, it's going to use R sync. If you fill out the stanza for R clone, it's going to you know use R clone. And we're putting in Restic right now, so you know that'll be a, a you know a third option. So yeah, it's it's just a matter of how you fill out your CR. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and then I see the question here: Is it possible to do a one-time sync? Um, not not really today. Uh, you could kind of mimic this by you know putting in a schedule that you know would would only run like once a year or something like that. And just the way the way we do it initially when that CR is created, it does a sync first thing. And so, you know, you would get one sync and then a really long delay and you could, you know, tear it down if you wanted to before that happened. But uh, we don't have an explicit like sync once and, and then stop. So that is actually a perfect segue, I think, into the next slide which is uh, the places that I think that we should talk about for uh, areas of collaboration. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to bring up is actually exactly that point, which is that if we refactored out, um, refactor some of this out, then we could reuse this in some of either the new work or some other work um, effectively. And I have a slide after this, so I don't wanna go into this one too much. I just want to get through this one real fast, but we'll move on to the next slide um, right after I finish this. But um, I'd also we'll, would like to talk about the places that we should add extensions for OpenShift specific resources. Um, things that I am thinking about um, are uh, configuration uh, inside the OpenShift cluster has config objects that would be most likely really useful for um, for lots of different reasons, but I think that would be an interesting one um, that we could explore. So I'd like to see if there's a way that we could write an extension uh, mechanism inside of Scribe so that we could contribute some OpenShift specific stuff to Scribe. Um, and then uh, S Tunnel and RSync. Um, we found we we as an MTC have found a lot of success using S Tunnel. Uh, to bridge the connection between two clusters and then are syncing the data across. This also gives us right the ability to like restart and stop and do the Kubernetes thing of like your pod dies and come back up and continue syncing. Um, and so one of the other things that I would like to bring up is, is, is this a potential way forward um, that we could contribute back along with the refactor and then we could use it. We could then integrate MTC with Scribe by vendoring it rather than uh, installing another controller um, is what I was going for. Um, so if I'm just gonna, can I just go on to the refactoring real quick of what I was thinking? Um, and then we can kind of talk about that. So sorry about this slide, not nearly as pretty as the others, um, but I hope it gets the point across. So today, from my understanding of the code, and John, please correct me if I misread it. Uh, today, all of the setup work uh, that happens inside of Scribe happens inside the reconcile function itself. Uh, inside the reconcilers or inside these uh, types that are inside the reconcile package. Um, and that makes it really hard to break them out and reuse these these pieces of code that are setting up all the infrastructure to do the same thing um, and not either doing like the reconciling of the infrastructure pieces or just creating the, the infrastructure pieces. The idea that I had was to break out the infrastructure setup pieces, um, which look a lot like what you have as internal types, I think. 
today. Um, and if we refactor them out into a library, then uh, different people could use that library to set up um, the infrastructure to do syncing, and we would be sharing the same infrastructure, um, which seems to me to be one of the hardest pieces to do to get this working is making sure your connection is set up, making sure that our sync is right, making sure that, you know, the, the pod security contexts are correct, making sure that there's a lot that goes into setting up these inf infrastructure pieces, making sure these infrastructure pieces are either a one-time thing or constantly reconciled, I think is, um, is, a, is not the hard, hard part, getting these initial pieces and in infra correct, I think is the hard part. So I'll just stop talking for a second and open it up for everybody else. Sharon, there may be one other thing of context to kind of help John to see part of what we envisioned, because this might be a little bit strange. John, one thing we are experimenting with is for the next version of Crane to try to satisfy something where we can be very flexible because what we're seeing in migrations is we're seeing that we can get a lot of the pieces needed and know what 90% of the problem is. But most of the customers have little tiny tweaks we didn't think of. And it could be, I don't know, maybe it's a resource code and the storage class has to change. And literally it comes down to maybe two lines have to change somewhere. There's enough of these small little tweaks that go on that maybe we haven't envisioned yet or seen and we were trying to find a way that could we restructure what we've solved in kind of two paths, thinking that for an end user, can we give them an experience that does the full migration and it's essentially an easy button? And then for somebody that's a little bit more in the know, uh, maybe a consultant field, application owner, can we give them the ability to take what they want of the solution and not use other pieces? So we were going... Uh, basically, like, almost like this two-prong kind of attack of that there would be a controller that would do the normal stuff we have to get the end goal. But under the covers of that, we want to break it out into small libraries that could probably be used as just CLI tools. So a consultant in the field could just, maybe they have a solution that's composed of five very small little CLI tools that do whatever part of the job is for a migration. And that could also be composed into a controller. But as we're approaching this, we are kind of changing some things and still proving out if this is possible. But do we, uh, so it's kind of this thing that maybe we don't always have to have a controller for some of the pieces. A controller could be useful, but maybe we have the solution accessible in a way that somebody could switch it up into a pipeline and just take little pieces that they want. And that's really the impetus behind part of what Sean is teasing out here is that if we don't have the standard integration point to be that we create a scribe CR, but then scribe does its work. If we could do something where we can leverage part of this code in a library and then bring it in, this is also, it has other things of what we're trying to do for an application owner and trying to make this, basically it's this whole thing and make a very small solution that's tightly scoped. And then we can compose that into something that's larger. Okay, I mean that that kind of makes sense. What 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 problem is Scribe trying to f solve today outside of the context of Crane or slash MTC? Like, like what was that created for? What was the intent behind Scribe in the first place? So the point of Scribe is to be able to do asynchronous storage replication uh, cross cluster, primarily for things like cross cluster DR. Um, you know, it's something that has been traditionally done um, at the storage system level, right, in, in the traditional environments. But the thing is, um, you know, not all storage systems can handle that. And it's, it's something where, you know, there, you really want a, a Kubernetes native solution to it, right? And you've got all this, all the storage abstraction with Kubernetes but yet you're going to now require somebody to have the identical storage systems on both sides and you know things like that it it just doesn't make sense right so instead we're we're bringing that 
that replication up to a, a Kubernetes level, right? Define it on your CRs and we'll replicate cross cluster, in cluster, whatever, um, independent of whatever storage system you put underneath. Now, the idea eventually is to sort of do the smart thing, right? So we're providing like the, the R sync that will get the job done no matter what storage system you've got. But if you've also, you know, if you've got a storage system that can do the offload, right, and do the replication itself, we would ideally like to be able to offload to the storage system, right? And we've got a couple ways where, where people could integrate there, but, um, you know, that's kind of a, a future thing. And right now we're focusing on kind of getting it getting the R-Sync working well, right? So that everybody's got a, a baseline to go from. So from an end user point of view, I would technically provision my app maybe from pipeline on two different clusters, but then I would start Scribe to synchronize the PV from one to the other. Is that kind of what the user journey would look like in your mind? Exactly. So we're, we're assuming that the, the user has a, a GitOps flow or, you know, this sort of infrastructure as code kind of thing, right? So they have, they know what they're, how to deploy their application, right? And, and have that controlled um, such that putting those YAMLs into one cluster or another cluster, right? They can handle that part. The idea is that they really need a solution to get the data in the PV from cluster one to cluster two. So I don't see then why not that would not work what you're describing, John. That kind of makes sense. It's the same approach. It's... Am I so, missing something? Uh, I don't think anything, I don't think anybody disagrees, Marco. I think what we're what we're talking about is ways to enable this technically, uh, so that we can we can leverage the work that's being done, as well as leverage the work that we did with DBM, as well as like bring the things that we've learned from both PVC Migrate as well as DBM to this project uh, as we work with customers and things like that. I think that's what we're saying. Is that a fair summary, John and Todd, of what we were thinking? I think so. What's in my mind is that we're both solving a similar problem. We've solved yeah. it with DVM and Rustic had its approach of it. DVM and Scribe are very close a DVM standalone control as well. If the storage team is going to be back in this and working into it, it just feels like we're all on the same problem and it makes sense to contribute here. And the changes that we would need, I think are fairly minimal. There's gonna be a different way to consume this. So consuming as a library, opposed to making it where it has to be a controller. The other stuff that would go in here is, I think it's been advantageous for us of using a route in OpenShift world for just trying to minimize those requirements, what happens. Because originally, we did use rsync over SSH, but we ran into different things depending on the environment, configurations, and stuff like that. Having something where we can leverage an OpenShift route and have SNL behind it, it's been nice. There are caveats. We have learned different things. We start going at scale, and there's some other things that we've kind of learned around that. But I think it would also be good for us to contribute another option to Scribe. So when I look at Scribe, what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing there there's solutions to problems in there, and let's just call it like 80, 90% of what we need. And there's some small little tweaks that don't quite work the way we want it for MTC. If we could contribute that back to Scribe so it's another option, this way Scribe has maybe several flavors of solving this. And then for the MTC case, we use one path, and then others use a different. That will, That's basically what was in my mind. So it's like one of them is that change to the consumption pattern. So we could use it as a controller if it makes sense, other times use it as a library. And then the other thing is that for some of these different cold flavors, if we could contribute back and then kind of work with the community in here. So we all have, when we're solving this PV migration problem or copying problem, uh, we get everybody kind of doing it in one spot so we can all leverage it. John, does that, that like high level concept, does that line up to what you're thinking? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's reasonable. I mean, I, I didn't really have any expectations coming in today, right? So it's, it's kind of all all new for me, right? And I'm gotcha. sort of trying to to get up to speed on you know on the on the context that, that you all have. Oh. Yeah, and I think the high level one is starting to see is um well I guess the first one is that are you willing to have us work with you? Would you be willing to take in some changes? <laughs> and if we can kind of go down that path, I think that's probably the big thing. And then we can always get the details later. 
yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly think that's something that we could, that we can explore. It sounds to me like um, we've encountered very similar problems and have uh, sort of tried to solve that independently in two, two different avenues. So it makes sense to collaborate in a singular place. I, I also had some questions um, because we've had uh, through uh, like our process of building sort of POC tools that ended up getting us out of some trouble with uh, in production environments. We've seen some problems um, that have kind of, kind of come up. Uh, did I, so is Scribe using rsync underneath or? Yes. Okay. We had some issues with, um, and this is getting kind of deep, but I guess this is the technical form. So it's sort of the appropriate place for the question, but um, we've had timeout problems. So, um, and, and there's just sort of some spookiness around like, uh, we, we we did a lot of investigation into it. Um, and so, I mean, typically we'd be running our sync for a long period of time in a customer environment. Um, their storage layer is of, let's say, questionable quality. Um, and some at some point, um, it usually appeared when we were migrating, let's like hundreds of gigabytes, for example, they get some, some period through that and then they get a connection timeout error. I think it's like an error 10 or something like that. We had a couple different variations of this, but um, it was fairly consistent in, in certain environments. And uh, we were able to replicate in our own environments. Um, and we spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what was happening. And the ultimately, I think, and Pranav, I don't know if Pranav's on the call, but he can jump in. Um, ultimately, it seemed like the flow of data, if like the, the pipe was just too fast. Um, for our our initial tool actually um, mounted the PVs directly and ran rsync directly on an OpenShift 3 node into a route that uh, was on an, on an OpenShift 4 target. And so there were a few layers there where like, I think there was an ELB that was involved. And then there's a target pod that was running rsync as a daemon. And we think the breakdown was actually occurring because the flow of data out of the node was unbounded. And so it was hitting the target side and it wasn't able to process it fast enough um, such that like there was some TCP code that was causing it to, to die, basically. It wasn't able to process it this fast. When we productionized this in a pod on the target side and we found that we applied some resource limits to that so that it was bounded, uh, we actually, we, we saw that timeout actually occurring less. So that's kind of like really in depth. We can get even more in depth if you want, but I'm just curious, like, have you seen any sort of like issues, strange problems like that, that you've seen that breaks down as you try to push our sync? Um, we haven't, but then again, you know, you guys are much farther along in terms of production usage. Okay. So, you know, it, I'm, I'm sure we will run into similar things. It's just a matter of when. Okay. Um, thanks. That answers the question. Um, it, it would be, I, I think it's like the, the endeavor to kind of combine forces here is a good thing. Like it, it would be great to compare notes on especially that sort of stuff and share our expertise. So I'm looking forward to this. And Scribe just sounds so similar to what we've been building with the DVM. Uh, this is like an obvious choice. Cool. So I, I see there was a question here um, by Brett in the in the chat um, about uh, let's see comparing I guess the this is like a, a question about whether to use like R sync versus R clone um, whenever moving the data and uh, I guess what we've been what we've been saying at, at this point is it's kind of how you want to set up the the relationships between the the source and destination. So if you're just looking at a one-to-one -one relationship between your you know a source PV and a destination PV, um, our sync is probably the way to go um, because you know that's gonna that's gonna minimize the changes that are sent. It you know things get sent directly from from one cluster to the other. Um, on the other hand, if you're trying to do like a, a one-to-many relationship, uh, so we were looking at Scribe for things like maybe uh, distributing data from like a central cluster out to a number of edge clusters or something like that. Um, that was kind of the original motivation for putting in the R clone method. Um, and whenever you use R clone, you basically push to a an object bucket someplace as an, an intermediate step. Right, so you've got your source cluster that's pushing data to 
um, to this intermediate location using uh, the R clone uh, capabilities, and then your destination clusters are pulling from that uh, that object bucket out to their um, to their location, also using R clone. So it's okay. it's kind of just a, a matter of you know what you know what your scenario actually is. Gotcha. Okay, makes sense. I I was just curious. On, it kind of touched a little bit on what Eric was um, alluding to there on some of the you know known issues that we've run into. But then also, you know, from a scale standpoint, how would this look overall? And uh, when when I would choose which option. So thanks for clarifying that. That made a lot of sense. Yep. Where, where our sync is not great though is when you have a large amount of small files that you need to copy over. Then it becomes really slow. Uh, so I'm just questioning this is the technical audience. So is that the right, the best solution to copy large amount of data when you have a large amount of files that you need to copy over from two different points? Uh, right. Can, so yeah, sorry, go ahead, John. I, I, was, gonna, I was just going to say, you know, the, um, you know, yes, it, our sync is going to have to walk the metadata, um, in that particular PV, right. And, and there's kind of no, no getting around that. Um, and that's probably one of the, the big areas where, you know, if you could offload to the storage system itself, right, you would get the benefit, right? Because the, the storage system that, that's able to do replication directly is going to be able to do actual change block tracking, right? And so essentially skip the metadata uh, scan. But, you know, if you're, if you're running above the file system level, um, you know, there's kind of no getting around at least looking at the metadata. Yeah, it would be it would probably be helpful to enumerate those cases too, where you're sitting above the files, like sitting at that layer, right? Like that. What that looks like is right now. Correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but like non CSI bull <laughs> stuff. So CSI snapshots all use the file system layer. They'll be a lot faster. That's the reason why we like most people are pushing people towards that because it's. Uh, it's easier to do all this stuff. Then the layer on top of that would be like, if you were going from uh, GP2 to some EKS, uh, or sorry, some uh, Azure storage system, you would most likely have to do this as well because those CSI drivers most likely will not interop between each other. So there's a, there's a if you're going from cloud A to cloud B, you might have to sit on top of the CSI snapshot, or if you were going from OCS to e uh, GP2 or something along those lines. Those are the cases with which you would have to walk the metadata because the snap, the files, the the storage system can't take a CSI snapshot, right? Is that like a correct assumption, John? Like correct story, John? Well, yeah, I guess because you can't directly. Um... Because you, you can't move the snapshot as a as a unit, right? Right. Yeah. You have to you have to sit on top of it and then translate that storage that storage layer stuff to the new storage layer stuff, basically. Yeah. Uh, so if we can quickly roll, is there any more questions on on this uh, on this? Um, Sean, are you asking if we're done with this topic as a whole, or just the yeah, slide? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. The the when to use rsync is rsync the right the right tool to use for this this enumeration of problems. Uh, I had a question. Yeah. Um, I was just curious if there were, like were any alternatives identified, or if anybody really looked. Uh, and and if not, that's okay. But I didn't have anything in particular in mind. But I thought I'd ask. Yeah, I mean, I I'm not aware of any viable alternatives. I mean, yeah. there's you know, there's kind of the the minimum set of of things that you have to do if you're running on top of a file system, right? You gotta, right? You gotta you gotta look and see what has changed, and you know, R sync seems to kind of be the best tool out there in terms of, there's, of efficiency. There's alternative, right? In the old school days of like, I remember like copying like. Being back as a sysadmin 20 years ago, copying large amount of files over the internet from East Coast to West Coast, and rsync was terribly slow because we had a large amount of files, so we were using different mechanism uh, 
I don't exactly remember the command, but I, I could look into it. But there's different FTP. tricks. Uh, yeah, there's different tricks of piping data from two locations that are not rsync based that can be fast, faster in some use cases. Because rsync had a lot of overhead on the copy, even more when you have latency in the mix and a large amount of files. So that's for sure. There's different mechanism, but are they? Yeah. Is there? We a really liked it one? for the uh, for the incremental uh, for, for the sure. incremental copy. I mean, it's like exactly. a gold standard. I, I think I think the biggest concern that we would have to whatever mechanism we use has to be able to support itself dying in the middle of a copy and being able to start from that point yeah. in time. It has to be able to do that because cube is going to kill your pods. Like it's just going to. So we have to like start with the assumption that it's going to fail in the middle of running. Um, that would be just and, my like. And that's probably b why our sync is the best option, even if it has a lot of overhead. But yeah, but I think it's just good to to think about it. Like, is is that the best that we can do? Or <laughs> if it is, it is. But that's why I was just opening the question. But that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess just one more question here about, uh, I guess, why we added Rustic. Um, and uh, we we got a specific request um, on the, the, the Rustic thing. Uh, and that was just that somebody was looking for a really simple backup solution. Um, so not, you know, not all the bells and whistles that you've got with like Volero or anything like that, right? Just a really simple, I've got a PV and if something bad happens to it, I want to be able to put the data back into it, right? And so, you know, that was, that was the idea. All right, so what, what um, I, I'm not sure there's, uh, to your point, Sean, we might be kind of getting to the end of this discussion. My, my question's gonna be from here, because uh, obviously I think this is a good idea for us to collaborate on sort of one area. Um, where, where do we go from here? What would be the next steps out of this meeting um, yeah. to kind of further this? Yeah, it, just to, I had one more slide. Oh, okay, I'm going. sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead no, of you. No, it's okay. I had one more slide that was just going through um, all of the OpenShift specific things that I would sure. like uh, to, to explore. We can talk about those later though. I think it totally makes sense to move on to, to, your, to, to your point. Um, but I'll send these slides out to the invite list after this so people can take a look at this. These are all conjectures anyway, just things that I thought about, um, stuff that we had you we can go through this. You can, there's not a okay. time. There's not a time yeah. problem, Sean. So okay. I, if, okay. feel free, feel free to run through this. <laughs> All right. So um, one of the things that we that we we use is routes, as was brought up earlier. I think those have specific value when you're working with OpenShift, um, especially while integrating with like OpenShift's configs and things like this. Um, would be interesting places to to figure out how we could extend Scribe. So that when it recognizes it's on OpenShift, it can do the OpenShift specific things, but then degrade to the Kubernetes stuff when it's on Kubernetes. And then maybe not even have the OpenShift stuff in the code, the core code base, right? Like the idea would be not to have, um, it would be to keep Scribe upstream focused, but have some way to make OpenShift be, uh, behave better. Um, also, uh, I didn't know if this was something that we wanted to explore more, but different data providers um, and like the, like Wick we kind of talked about just a second ago, um, you're going from NFS to block storage or something along these lines. There's definitely things with permissions and the volumes and all kinds of other stuff that we have to care about. And that leads into this, the security context bit, which we did a lot of investigation and work to make sure that security context for our pods are as secure as they can be, um, while continuous continue doing the the thing they needed you, um, and having a discussion around what kind of security context. How is there something that we can do for mapping from the soon to be deprecated pod security context to uh, the uh, security context constraints that OpenShift provides and this kind of stuff would be the OpenShift specific stuff. 
But that's just a quick run through. This is all conjecture, but just stuff that I uh, had in the back of my mind and I was thinking about the what nice things could we add for OpenShift um, and our platform to make going from a Kubernetes platform to our platform a better experience. So that was all I had left. Uh, do we want to go into the next steps? I didn't have a slide for next steps. Mm. Uh, I think we could just kind of talk about it and I could just start seeding the thoughts I have. So, and just kind of like just some context for John of timelines of what we're looking at. Uh, right now we have out Crane on like the 1.x kind of architecture. And we are exploring this month at POC. We're kind of proving out that concept I mentioned to you about, can we have two things? Can we have an all-in-one easy button? But can we also have individual tools that can be composed as somebody wants to? And think of that as right now, we don't know. Uh, we have a PLC this month that's trying to prove it. We think it's going to work out. We also are trying to do this exclusively from allowing an application owner to do the migration. So we have more flexibility than what we did in the past of a cluster admin. And we're also doing this in a pure Kubernetes solution, not focusing on relying on OpenShift primitives. So it's kind of like all the stuff coming together. We're still playing this out in roughly April for the PLC. And if that works okay, and we just prove the viability of this approach, then our next thing in May is to start really working on what Crane 2.0 is going to be. So rough idea timeline, I think, is that the engineers probably need a few more weeks just to prove out the viability of our approach and get a little bit more into the problem space. So we feel that um, we have the understanding of it. After that's in there, the next thing in our mind right now is that when we write Crane 2.0 for doing PV migration, Crane 2.0 will use Scribe. So we're kind of just looking at that. This is the path forward that we want to go to is we want to use Scribe. So as we start getting to probably about early May, I think that's when we're going to have a better feeling of, okay, when we look at Scribe, what are the first things we need to do to kind of plug things in? Um, and I, Sean's kind of like giving you a taste of what we think. We haven't actually done the work yet to put it together and kind of see if that's really the right path and all that. So it's still kind of early, but that's the rough kind of thinking is that the engineers probably need another something like three, four weeks in the problem space just to play with the POC. After that is good. We are hoping that May is when we can really start cranking on the development of Crane 2.0. And as we do that, I don't know exactly when, but I'm kind of thinking it could be early May that we have a better feeling and we can come back to you and say, what do you think if we did blah? Do you think that's good, bad? How would you like to structure work? And then we could um, kind of just you know, see what makes sense with you. If, how do we want to break this up? How can we contribute? OK, sure. Um, that sounds reasonable. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess in, in the meantime, I should probably get a little bit more, a little bit more familiar with the architecture that you guys are, are kind of you know, working under today and, and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not really sure what the, what the best approach is to kind of get up to speed on that. But um, if, if you, you give us have suggestions, give us maybe two, three weeks to try to get this demo together. And once we have the demo together and we'll have some ugly throwaway code that we can kind of show so you can get like a feel. But our thought is that I have explicitly asked everyone, write stuff you're going to throw away. Don't worry about it. Just get something quick so we can prove the viability because uh, we really want to get the knowledge of the problem space. But we can show you that, and we can have another follow-up meeting where we can go through this is what the high-level thinking is. OK. But I fall in love with the code I write, so I don't want to throw it away. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, also, if you have like one-off questions, John, like after this, too, you can just ping me. You can always ping me. I, I'm always free to chat. Um, OK. All right. Do you have any one-offs? That sounds that sounds that sounds great. Um, we um, so I think that's unless there's anything else on this topic. There actually is another topic that was added to the agenda. I don't. Um, I'm not sure who added that. Um, I did. Sorry. We've got we've got no 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 no. That's that's fine, Sean. Um, we've got 15 minutes left, so I'll leave it up to you to say is that something that you think we can have a. Uh, a good conversation on that in 15 minutes, or is that a, a candidate for push, or do you want to give kind of a preliminary on what you wanted to talk about? I'll leave it up to you. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe just a preliminary, and then we can open it up and see if people think we can have a reasonable conversation in 15. 
Um, my guess is probably not, but um, I did some exploring of how different folks are using, are doing transformations across conveyor. Um, I wanted to get on the same page about what are the best practices when doing that. Um, I think that would probably involve making sure that everyone is on the same page with how transformations are happening in the different projects today, whether that be this throwaway code in MTC 2.0, move to cube or some other project that's um, doing some sort of transformations of Kubernetes resource like customize or something along those lines. There's also like Carvel from uh, VMware. I think we probably would want to take a look at how people are doing this and come together on what do we think the best practices are for both um, a supportable thing as well as uh, customer accessibility and things like that. Um, Can you define so transformation, what transformation means in your head? Like just so we're all sure, on the same sure, page. Sure. Yeah, so transformation means uh, like when you take a Kubernetes resource and you change it when you are backing it up or restoring it so that you can apply it to a new cluster um, would probably be the Sean, best way. Sean, do you have like a, um, like what's your go-to example that you've been using for that? Like why would I want to do that? Go-to example would be like if I back up a pod resource and I want to apply that pod to cluster B, you have to remove the spec.node yep. field from that. Otherwise it will not schedule on the new cluster because that node does not exist on the new cluster, right? It's just a very simple thing that you have to do. And how do we make sure that this is easy for people who are doing backup restores? Yeah, it's like an example of a SNP. I can also, I'm kind of asking to seed the conversation, but also like we've had the yeah. node selector problem, we've had the resource quotas, all that stuff. Right, right, all, all of those things, right? And so like that's where, that's kind of where I was starting at is the, there's a minimal set of things that you must do. And there's also extensible things that you must do, right? Uh, a lot of customers have different node taints and other things that they would have to make sure that they set up for cluster B that's maybe not for cluster A. Like these are things that they would want to add or remove or change or mutate. And these are the these are the kind of things that we would want to talk about. Or at I least think. know about because so that yeah. would be the first step. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, hopefully the people who are doing this translation know about those things, but yes, I, I, <laughs> I hear your point. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, agreed. So do we think we can have a fruitful conversation in now 10 minutes since I took five minutes explaining <clears throat> this? So sorry about that, everybody. I think it's probably a teaser for the next meeting. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Is there anything that would help uh, help us have that conversation? That some examples, I think, if we can come back useful. and I think it'd be great if we could tease out two, three examples of okay. things that we've hit. Uh, just give a little more context. I um, I'd also be interested in seeing like what what are the various ways that people are doing this because it seems like there's a few different like similar to scribe and dvm there's a bunch of different approaches although it sounds like the community has kind of coalesced and it's customized right i mean that's in cube control at this point or cube cuddle yeah what does it look like like but we've also heard you know there's like json what is it json ed or something like that there's um i think json ed and json ed are, are no longer a thing uh, they're still a thing. I don't think anybody is as hyped about them as they were like a year ago. I think that's the case, but I'm not. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm saying fans. that because I'd be interested in seeing examples of like, this is how you express this transformation with this tool. Yep. Okay. Would the very simple, you must remove the, the spec dot node from a pod YAML be a good example or sort of different example that folks have in mind. That what I'm like kind of interested in is like, um, it's the one that we hit, right? Where like uh, namespace has a node selector on it. Uh, so anything that ends up in that namespace on a source side is gonna get scheduled to a node that matches while your target side probably doesn't have nodes okay. that are going to match. So, so maybe, so uh, and maybe I do have, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, 
So, so I might want to map um, a, a, a source node selector to a target node selector, which okay. is really just muta mutating the value, I think. Given this input value, change it to this value for my target, something like that, or removing it, one of the two. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's uh, for a set of pod speckable thing. Well, yeah, sorry. Let me, I'm begging the implementation detail at that point. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I see. Uh, instead of the, the spec.node, I'll definitely just do the taints and selectors and make sure that we we can mutate those however you need to. Um, that will be the example that I that I I'll but, probably try to do. Uh, if, if there is any uh, particular example that you'd like to see, I'd love if you could just ping me offline so I could put that together. Um, if you have sure. your favorite. Or if somebody wants to help me compile all of these examples together, I would also probably love the help. Uh, so if anybody would like to help me do this, uh, please ping me. Since it sounds like I'm taking the work <laughs> to go do but, this. But when you think of Kubernetes definition, out. there's a lot of things that can be cluster specific, right? There's a long list of definition Absolutely. that, Absolutely. so the question is, I guess also the, what I would be interested to know more about is not necessarily just the list of things that can be cluster specific because I, can, I think that the list is long, but what are the best practices to, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't even know where to start. Like, like is, is that really, are we, is the objective to have some kind of magic way of solving that all everything that could be cluster specific when you're migrating something from one cluster to another? <laughs> I can or is, should that be more pip a pipeline? Sorry, well, go ahead. Part of the vision and mark of this one is that I think it's like twofold. One of them is that um, the community is going to learn things that are kind of needed to help out for the transformations over time. If we can get that knowledge somewhere, and this stuff would be, uh, it could be something like EKS to, I don't know, like AKS or something. Maybe there's some kind of different details that are built up. So it could be environmental specific stuff. There's also probably be some knowledge that maybe it's just built up in the nature of that particular resource when it goes from one cluster to another cluster, just based on the cluster itself there. The thing that we were trying to go high level is that can we build up a knowledge of, uh, build up a library of knowledge somewhere? This way the community can like leverage that thing. And can we make it tweakable? Because that's the thing that we have struggled, struggled so much with on our side is exposing those things to be tweakable. So part of it's almost like educating somebody and being opinionated to say, this is what we think you need. And then you can just go with it. But then whenever they need to customize it to be able to do a customization. And that's the high thing we're trying to get. Whatever we pick for whatever technology, if we can do something where we can build up the knowledge, but can we still make it so it's easy to tweak when somebody needs to? Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that it just sounds like a very complex problem to solve because outside of even, even in the most simplistic use case, right? OpenShift to OpenShift, same version, like a node selector would be something different, right? So even something just as simple as that, like I'm wondering, that's why I'm wondering like outside, yeah, I think it's totally great to list like all the possibilities, but outside of that, like how should that be dealt with from a user experience point of view in general, like, uh, so I think, I don't think that what I, I don't think the conversation would, I agree with you. The conversation would not be fruitful to try to figure out how we can handle every single one of these things uh, for every single customer. I think the conversation would be fruitful is if we determine the best way and we all agree on how we allow customers to customize the set of customizations that we think they should apply. So we have, as John was mentioning, we have a library of knowledge that we've gained over these past two years. This is what you need to do to go from cluster A to cluster B for all these different resources. This is what we think are the best, um, the best applications that you should use. And then allowing a user to tweak those applications for their own need. What is the best and easiest way for a user to go and do that? I think is what, we're at, what the conversation is around. So I, don't, I think that it needs to be something where um, a user has the ability to say, oh, I want to use all of the stuff that you provided except for X. And then when they, when, instead of X, I want to use X prime or something, right? Like they, they, just, they, they tweak it slightly. Um, how do, what is the best way to do that? I think is the conversation. 
there's a bunch of different ways to apply transformations to cube manifests. And I think that's where uh, the conversation could start in that we look at all of these different ways and we can kind of figure out what is the, um, what is the most reason, what is, what do we think, what do we like about one way versus the other? What are the pros and cons of each approach? And then hopefully we can start to come up with a framework for evaluating these. Um, does that seem reasonable to folks? Yeah, uh, Sean, this is Ashokia. Okay. Um, actually, we had uh, done a very similar exercise when we uh, implemented uh, the transform for Mutocube. So probably we can uh, um, present whatever the slides that we had created as part of that exercise in the next meeting too. Uh, so see that discussion. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. All right, Do fantastic. You want, oh, go ahead. Can John. you? Yeah, I was going to ask, can you send me those slides beforehand? Since if you've already done all the work that I was talking about compiling <laughs> examples, uh, it'd be great if I didn't have to. Yeah, we don't have any examples as it because our okay. uh, goal was to allow for any kind of transformations. That was the use case that we wanted in MutuQ. But we had cataloged the JSON patch, customize, and uh, star log, and the various other ways, and the libraries for each one of them, and what it allows and not. Um, uh, Hari and uh, Hari, who is on this call, has put together. We can send the rough draft now, probably uh, in the present, uh, we find one on the next week. Sounds good. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Fantastic, folks. So um, I, th I think we'll stop here. We're, we've got about two minutes short. Um, uh, just a reminder. Uh, so I'll send the, uh, once we get the recording, Marco, if you can forward that over to me, we'll send that out. Um, for folks um, and a reminder. So I think our plan for next week will, or next end of next month, um, we'll, uh, we'll continue this conversation. But in the meantime, if there's other areas or other topics, um, kind of seeing how this went that you want to propose, again, add those to the agenda document and uh, we'll, we'll begin to plan that out sort of over the next, uh, uh, next couple months. If we find the need that we need to have these more frequently, um, we can certainly um, move to a bi-weekly um, if that makes more sense. Um, anyway, uh, thanks everybody for your participation um, and we'll see you next time. I have a quick question yep. before we go, Todd, just for the slides that um, I'm going to share. Uh, it looks like we have the conveyor community on here. Should I share this from an upstream Gmail so that the entire community can see it, even though this has OpenShift specifics and what I discussed with Scribe and stuff, or should, do you think this should stay internal? Uh, I think everything we talked about is all open. Yeah.